Hi, welcome to our YouTube-friendly version of NTD News. What you'll see here is only the content that YouTube allows. For our complete uncensored broadcast, head on over to ntd.com and you can click on the link below. See you there. A powerful hurricane is approaching Southern California. The storm is expected to bring heavy rains, strong winds, and high waves to the region. NTD's Stephanie Sakal reports. A rare hurricane is expected to hit this weekend and could bring impact to California and southwest U.S. On Thursday morning, the National Hurricane Center reported that Hillary grew to become a Category 4 hurricane in the Pacific Ocean. But it is predicted to lose strength prior to reaching California. It's expected to arrive in Southern California on Sunday or Monday. Hillary is expected to bring heavy rain to the parts of the Baja California Peninsula and the southwestern United States. This kind of rain in August is quite rare. It could start on Sunday and last until Tuesday, so there's a chance of rain for three days. Flash flooding, heavy rains and strong winds are expected to affect areas in the potential danger zone including San Diego, Los Angeles, Imperial Valley, Tijuana, and nearby regions that will make driving conditions dangerous and potentially prompt road and bridge closures. For more information on how to stay prepared for such event, visit www.weather.gov safety slash hurricane hyphen plan. The experts will keep providing more updates on the storm, so people need to keep an eye on the news and weather reports to stay safe. Stephanie Sikal, NTD News, Los Angeles. Meanwhile in Canada, a major city is now under an evacuation order as raging wildfires approach. Yellowknife is the capital of Canada's Northwest Territories, and all 20,000 city residents have been ordered to leave before the blaze reaches their homes. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of surreal up there right now. We've got uh, lots of smoke in the air, and that's not new. Nobody envisioned an event of this scale, um, and it, it was just, and it's still really stressful. There's a lot of people left in Yellowknife that are freaking out. Traffic has clogged the only highway leading away from the epicenter of the blaze. Fire crews in the area are doing all they can to battle the flames, digging fire breaks, spreading fire retardant, and dropping water from the air. Canada is going through its wildfire season, and this year is by far the worst on record. The infernos in the Northwest Territories are among more than 1,000 fires burning across the country. And in British Columbia, a fast-moving wildfire has engulfed a significant number of homes. A state of emergency was declared in a city east of Vancouver. Officials in the area said that the next 24 to 48 hours could be the most difficult. Smoke from this fire season has made the air unhealthy in parts of Canada and the U.S. And turning to former President Trump, his legal team wants to delay the start date of the D.C. trial years down the line. NTD's Melina Weiskopf joins us from the Fulton County Jail, where she's tracking the latest indictment. Melina, we'll talk about Georgia in just a moment, but first, tell us about Trump's move to delay the trial in the DOJ case. There's trying to fight against these legal challenges, Trump's lawyers are. So Trump's lawyers have recently requested for the DOJ's 2020 trial date to be set for April of 2026, arguing that there's just too much information to go through to meet uh, special counsel Jack Smith's January 2nd deadline. Trump's lawyers say there are 11 and a half million documents to review, which will make it difficult to meet that deadline. But ultimately, the trial date is up to the presiding judge, which is Tanya Chuckin. All right. Thanks for that update, Melina. And on the Georgia case against the former president and 18 others, is there any update on that? So the latest update here is one of the defendants, Jeffrey Clark. He's the second to respond after Mark Meadows. He's taking issue with the proposed March 4th trial date that the DA has put forth, calling it premature. As far as how Jeffrey Clark is expected to move forward, we expect him to follow in the footsteps of Mark Meadows, who recently filed to try to move his case to federal court. Jeffrey Clark is going to uh, try to do this, considering he was an acting DOJ official at the time that these actions took place. Now, as for former President Trump, he has 
has canceled that press conference on Monday meant to refute the Georgia indictment. We'll read you exactly what he had to say as to why he's canceling it. And if we could show you his quote as well, he says, my lawyers would prefer putting this, I believe, irrefutable and overwhelming evidence of election fraud and irregularities in formal legal filings. Therefore, the news conference is no longer necessary. There's also some news about Trump's plans to attend next week's first GOP primary debate. We're seeing reports that he plans to skip this. We have not been able to independently verify that just yet, but Trump did make a very bold comment on Truth Social saying that other presidents didn't debate, so why should he? In other news, as far as his surrender goes, here at this Fulton County Jail behind me, we are seeing reports that he could come here to surrender sometime next week. We're still working to independently verify that with his lawyers. The only confirmation that we have at this moment, based on what we know, is that the sheriff's office says that they are all 19 defendants, including former President Trump, still have a next Friday deadline to come here to surrender. But Trump's case could be different because he does have secret service protection, so they could make some arrangements with the Fulton County Sheriff's Office to avoid security and safety concerns. And on that note, this jail right now is actually under investigation by the DOJ for unsafe and unsanitary living conditions. Back to you. All right. Thanks for that update, Melina. And earlier, I spoke with Cash Patel for his assessment of the latest developments. Cash is a former national security prosecutor and former federal public defender. He was also a defense official under Trump. Cash, great to see you here. First, I just want to get your main takeaways from this Georgia indictment. Hey, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on the programming. Um, look, the main takeaways are, one, I believe the, uh, not even special counsel, the Fulton County District Attorney, who's acting like a special counsel, uh, broke the law with her illegal disclosure of grand jury information six hours before she revealed it nearly at midnight to the world. And then she lied about it by saying, oh, I don't know how these court proceedings and paperwork processes are conducted. As a former federal prosecutor, that's a flat out lie. You are responsible for the indictment until it is lawfully released after signature by the chief judge. I think that's the first point of contention for uh, this indictment. And the latest update is that former President Trump is canceling the Monday press event where he said he would unveil evidence of election fraud in Georgia. And he's now saying that he'll present those findings in court. How could this shift impact the legal proceedings and the public's understanding of the situation? Yeah, I think if President Trump were not running for president again, then the press conference was a good idea. But I think the uh, what's of primary importance to him, in my opinion, is contesting the legal proceedings in a fashion that does so with the utmost efficacy. So filing that matter in federal and state court first which will become a public document automatically, um, allows him to be consistent with his defense teams talking at the same time, not that there's multiple venues going on. So I think it's a smart move. And I don't think you're going to see anything left out. I just think you're going to see it filed in federal court, which garners more attention even than a Trump press conference. And the proposed trial date by the prosecution is just before Super Tuesday next year. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Well, look, as a former national security prosecutor and public defender who handled lots of these cases, an average federal indictment takes about minimum one to two years to get to trial, depending on its complexities. And we're talking about the former president of the United States, classified information, multiple co-defendants. Now, state court is three to four times slower because they have three to four times the volume. And I've been in state court as well. So I think, um, you know, when the Georgia prosecutor asked for all of this 19 co-defendant case to be tried in six months, it shows you the political impetus they have behind that. Having tried 20 co-defendant cases, that took about three years in federal court to get the job done. They're down there in state court. Now you see their intentions revealed. Right. Now, last night on Crossroads, you mentioned that the indictment only requires probable cause and not evidence mm -hmm. of guilt. Do you know if it would still apply if the case is moved to a federal court? Which at they least would Mark have, Meadows is trying for. Yeah, yeah. so that's a, that's a strategic maneuver that I think is legally well-founded because as the Georgia prosecutor admitted herself in her indictment, 
the corruption and racketeering is about federal law. So a state court doesn't have jurisdiction, and any individual has the right to rem what we call remove a case to federal court. And so the indictment would be presented in federal court. Again, it would not be evidence of guilt. It would just be an indictment based upon the grand jury's decision in Georgia, but the whole thing would have to go there. Now, that's going to take months of litigation alone. Every one of those single 19 defendants has a right to make that maneuver, and the federal courts has a right to decide it. So who knows when we're ever going to see the arraignment and discovery process begin in this year. Right. And if it does, you know, go to the federal court, what would be the advantages and disadvantages of that? Well, one, it's it's a leaner court system. So you don't have the volume of criminal and civil cases up there. And federal courts tend to move with a little more expediency. But what you also have is the adjudication of federal law up front, along with the adjudication of state law issues. This RICO case is being, in my opinion, baselessly used to Donald Trump because it was a quote unquote corrupt activity to challenge the election, but that's not an illegality. And the overt acts used by the Georgia prosecutor to demonstrate this sort of conspiracy weren't illegal either. So there's a lot of legal issues that the judge in state or federal court is going to have to adjudicate before we ever get to a trial. And you've said that Congress should test the validity of the leaked indictment document and that it could yeah. be caused for a motion to dismiss. Could you expand on that and what that process would look like? Yeah, so normally what happens is when there's a violation of grand jury proceedings, which is a felony, the chief judge of the district comes in and says, I'm holding you in contempt of court. Why did you, whether it's a prosecutor or someone else, leak grand jury information? And then that's a separate felony, federal offense. I don't have faith in this chief judge or this jurisdiction to do that since they're the ones that authorized this indictment and allowed it to be leaked. So Congress, who provides general funding to Georgia state law enforcement officials, has a jurisdictional nexus to subpoena Fannie Willis and say, you need to come up here and your entire team and say, who leaked this? You said you don't know anything about it and you don't know how the court system works. OK, well, if you didn't lie, then how did an identical copy of the indictment get released six hours beforehand? And legally, back in the court system, once you have that illegal act, the rest of the indictment is flawed and should be thrown out. All right. And last question. And now that we've got these four cases against Trump all progressing simultaneously, there are a lot of details that can be pretty confusing to the American people. <laughs> what should they be paying attention to amidst all of this noise? Right. The good thing about court, and this is the thing I've told President Trump and said publicly, is now you have a vehicle in state and federal court to file federal pleadings, state court pleadings, witness lists, motions, defense paperwork, things that will be available to all public, not edited, and you can consume and ingest that as whether you're just a court watcher, a person who wants information on election day, and you don't have to have the slant from the fake news. This is the this is a huge bonus for President Trump. He's allowed subpoena power. He can go ahead and call the likes of Nancy Pelosi and Hillary Clinton and ask them why they objected to an election and why he can't. That's a defense he can make in court to a jury. And the power of, as we talked about at the top of the show, of him filing that um, election motion or election pleading, um, this courtroom now is his vehicle to do that. And it's official paperwork. And it's going to go far and wide, probably further and wider than even a Trump rally. All right. Well, thank you so much. Cash Patel, great to hear your insights. Thanks so much. Have a great day. A federal judge in Delaware dismissed two misdemeanor tax charges against Hunter Biden. The president's son allegedly failed to pay taxes on time in 2017 and 2018. The charges were part of his now defunct plea deal. They were dropped at the request of special counsel David Weiss. Closing the book on that case enables him to pursue new charges in California or Washington, D.C. IRS whistleblowers told Congress they recommended charging the president's son with six felonies, including tax evasion and filing false tax returns. The tax case against Biden is separate from the felony gun possession charges he's also facing. And the U.S., Japan and South Korea holding a historic summit today at Camp David. That says rising threats from China and North Korea are drawing Washington and its key Asian allies steadily closer together. Joining us now live is NTD's Iris Tao from the White House. Iris, what makes today's summit significant and what did the leaders say? 
though today is a historic moment as U.S., Japan, and South Korea came together to hold their first ever standalone summit. And this is also the first time that President Biden has hosted foreign leaders at Camp David, which is a rustic mountain retreat in Maryland where a lot of important diplomatic moments happened in history. And today, as we are facing this rising threat from China, President Biden vowed to start this new era of trilateral cooperation with Japan and South Korea to bolster security. Here's what he said during their meetings. As we begin this new era of cooperation and renew our resolve to serve as a force of good across the Indo-Pacific and, quite frankly, around the world as well. So later in the afternoon, they held a trilateral press conference in the woods of Camp David. And while there, they announced that these three countries are going to have a new security agreement in which they're going to consult each other if and when a crisis happens in the Pacific region. So that's a new thing. And they're also announcing new military exercises every year, as well as annual meetings among their leaders, among a variety of other items to cooperate on, of course. But this is not a mutual defense agreement like NATO. But China does not see it that way, with Beijing already accusing these three leaders of trying to start a mini NATO in the Pacific region. The White House this morning denied that, and President Biden said during the press conference that this whole summit was not about China, but he said that China did come up and the leaders expressed concerns about China's economic coercion, as well as the tensions that is creating in the Indo-Pacific region. And here's what else he said. Watch. And today, We've reaffir all reaffirmed our shared commitment to maintain peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits and addressing, ec and addressing economic coercion. Together, we're going to stand up for international law, freedom of nav navigation, and the peaceful resolution of disputes in the South China Sea. And the joint statement issued by the three countries afterwards also directly called out China's, quote, dangerous and aggressive behavior in the South China Sea. And they again affirmed the importance of peace in the Taiwan Strait. So it's pretty significant how South Korea and Japan actually came together to have this direct mention of China in their statement, especially given how much their economies actually depend on trade with China. Steph. It is a big step, but Iris, how can we be sure that today's commitment will last, especially given the political changes that could happen in each country? So, Seth, that's a great question. So, President Biden today kept stressing that today's agreement is not just about today, this month, or this year. It's going to last for decades, he says. And it's pretty clear that the three leaders want to extend this alliance beyond any future elections or even potential changes in leadership. And that's why President Biden called today a, the beginning of a new era. Steph. Thanks for that update, Iris. Next, NewsGuard got back with us after our story about the media rating company yesterday. They provided a comment from the CEO of NewsGuard, Gordon Kravitz. The comment reads, NewsGuard rates every publication based on the same nine basic apolitical criteria of journalistic practice. Under our rating system, Fox News scores higher than MSNBC, The Daily Caller scores higher than The Daily Beast, and the Daily Wire scores higher than the Daily Coast, which would not be the case if our ratings were biased against conservative media or against independent media. Nurse Lucy Letby has been convicted of murdering seven babies and attempting to kill six others. This makes her the UK's most prolific child serial killer in modern times. The nurse worked at the neonatal unit at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. In 2015 and 2016, there was a significant rise in the number of babies who suffered serious and unexpected collapses in the unit. Letby was the only member of the staff who was on duty each time. She used various ways to harm the babies, including injecting air into the bloodstream, injecting air into the stomach, overfeeding with milk, physical assaults, and poisoning with insulin. Prosecutors said she was a calculated opportunist who used the vulnerabilities of premature and sick infants to camouflage her acts. And major Chinese property developer Evergrande files for bankruptcy protection in New York. This as part of one of the world's biggest debt restructurings. It will allow Evergrande to protect its assets in the U.S. as it works out a deal with creditors. NTD Business's Don Ma talks to a China analyst. 
And now here with me to discuss the Evergrande situation is Brian McCarthy, China analyst and chief strategist at Economic Strategy and Market Insight firm MacroLens. So we've talked a lot about China's property crisis here. So Evergrande is filing for bankruptcy protection. Uh, but I have to make the distinction it's not formally declaring it cannot pay its debts. So, I mean, to start off, just give us your general thoughts. What do you think about this? Yeah, Evergrande is just continuing to limp along. Um, from all reports, you know, their main agenda is to try to get completed some of the many thousands of units that have been paid for by Chinese citizens, but yet, uh, yet to be completed and delivered. So Evergrande is continuing on in that mission. Um, the bankruptcy filing is, I think, just a sort of a technical move to restrict creditors' ability to sue the company to, to uh, Hong Kong, where uh, there are currently discussions with bondholders taking place as to who's going to get what. And I think the bottom line is nobody's going to get much of anything, uh, which has been clear for, for many, many months. The Chapter 15 filing, um, apparently it's a, quote, normal, normal part of offshore uh, restructuring um, that is normal procedure. Well, what's your reaction to that? This is just something normal. Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I, I don't think it really has any bearing on how we should view Evergrande, which is dead man walking for many, many months now. Uh, some deal will get made and, and creditors will end up with some asset that's worth, call it 10 percent of, of what they, you know, what, the, what their bond holdings were in terms of face value. So I guess nobody was surprised about this. Do, do you think Evergrande can successfully come back through its uh, restructuring plan? No. No, I think they'll, they'll be they'll be helped along uh, in the hopes that they can complete some of the many thousands upon thousands of empty apartments that they've they've accepted payment for and not yet delivered. So the Chinese government is endeavoring to avoid widespread you know social unrest. I, I think the extent of the bailout for these sort of egregiously levered developers that are that are failing. Uh, in you know the the numbers involved in these failures, like we're, we're talking to Evergrande losing you know eighty billion dollars over six months. I think the extent of the bailout will be they'll be provided sufficient funding to try to make make whole the homeowners who have paid for apartments. So you know the the, the government is going to have to support them to some extent to get that done. Uh, beyond that, I doubt there'll be any any bailout for for anybody. I, I imagine they'll be wiped out, shut down, or um, maybe limp along as a shell of their former selves. But these entities are not coming back. I think the domestic banks and creditors are going to have to have to take losses on this. Wow, great insight today, Brian. Fantastic, thank you. Great to catch up with you, Tom. Moscow faces another drone attack near a major convention center. Residents share mixed feelings, from fear to confidence. NTD's Jason Perry has the latest on the Russia-Ukraine war. Russia says its air defense systems shot down another Ukrainian drone in Moscow. Fragments fell near a major convention center about three miles from the Kremlin. It gets scarier and scarier to come here. I wish this would end soon. It's very nerve-wracking. Others were more optimistic after the incident. Of course, we are protected. Only a few drones fall. They break through by chance. We feel completely safe. While Ukrainian drones continue to reach deep into Russian territory, Ukraine's air force is another story. Ukrainian forces are still flying outdated Soviet-era helicopters. But they try to make up for it by using various tactics. We fly at low altitudes and approach very quickly. That is, in literally half an hour, we can approach any target. If we have F-16s, then we'll be free to fly, and Russia's air defense troops and planes will move away from us. And it seems Ukraine's wishes are closer to reality now. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken recently told Denmark and the Netherlands that the U.S. fully supports the transfer of F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine once the pilots are trained. While Russia and Ukraine continue to attack each other over their shared border, some are now focusing on Ukraine's border with Belarus. Ukraine's commander of the Joint Forces recently paid a visit to the Belarus border area. We will provide everything necessary for the guys to skillfully improve various aspects. But the most important thing is the determination in the eyes of our soldiers. 
And the Belarusian president, Alexander Lukashenko, said this on Thursday. Nuclear weapons, which we have in Belarus, will indeed never be used. But if there is an act of aggression against us, an attack on Belarus, we won't hesitate. We'll use our whole arsenal of weapons. Many are wondering how F-16s will impact the battlefield. But fighter jets aren't the only advanced military equipment heading Ukraine's way. Ukraine just received two air defense systems from Germany. And Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky thanked Germany for the equipment. Jason Perry, NTD News. Americans waiting record times for their passports. There's a post-pandemic application backlog, the likes of which we've never seen. But there are ways to speed things up. NTD's Faye Quarter has more. Americans who are trying to obtain or renew passports are having to wait far longer than usual. Processing times can range from two to three months. And this is a, a post-pandemic phenomenon. The demand is unprecedented. And the State Department's having trouble hiring enough people. They're short-staffed and there's too much demand. Philip Ballard is an executive at Hotel Planner, a popular booking site. He says if you're renewing your passport, you should start at least six months before its expiration date. He also describes several ways to speed up the process. There is an emergency uh, application. Uh, this has to be for a life-threatening situation, and so they can respond within 72 hours. There's another category called urgent travel, and that's if you're traveling within 14 days, you can call and, and request an expedited uh, uh, passport. They have what's called expedited, which is within seven to nine weeks. It costs 60 extra dollars. And then there's the routine applications, and those take 10 to 13 weeks right now. You can also call private companies that claim to speed up the process even more, though experts recommend researching them before becoming a client. These companies would need access to sensitive personal information. If all else fails, there are still many incredible travel destinations within the U.S., like the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii. You don't need a passport to visit any of them. Faye Quarter, NTD News. Welcome back. If you're just joining us now, here are some of today's top headlines. Hurricane Hillary is expected to hit Southern California this weekend. The Category 4 hurricane will be bringing heavy rains, strong winds, and high waves to the region. An evacuation order issued for the capital of Canada's Northwest Territories due to wildfires. Canada is struggling with the worst wildfire season on record. Trump's legal team seeks a 2026 trial date in the federal elections case. And in the Georgia case, one of Trump's co-defendants, Jeffrey Clark, is rejecting the March 2024 trial date. The former president says he's canceling the press conference on election fraud scheduled for Monday. President Biden is hosting the leaders of Japan and South Korea for a summit at Camp David. This is the first standalone meeting for the three powers as they commit to deeper cooperation. Maui's emergency chief, Herman Andaya, stepped down yesterday. He cited health reasons in his resignation. Andaya faced criticism over the island's response to the disaster. Some are adamant that lives could have been saved if the island-wide alarm system had been used. Andaya's departure takes effect immediately, leaving the top spot open. Maui County Mayor Richard Bisson said yesterday that someone will be placed in the position as quickly as possible. This comes a day after Andaya defended the decision not to sound the island's warning sirens due to the deadly fires. He feared it would drive people to evacuate toward danger. New York City might start housing illegal immigrants in an old jail. Meanwhile, the city's mayor responds to allegations by the state's governor who says the Big Apple is mishandling the crisis. New York City wants to house immigrants in Manhattan's Metropolitan Correctional Center. The infamous jail closed down in 2021, following years of complaints over dangerous conditions. It's also where Jeffrey Epstein died. Mayor Eric Adams' administration is now asking permission from the feds to use the facility to house illegal immigrants. The Federal Bureau of Prisons on Thursday said it couldn't comment on the issue. Also on Thursday, Adams responded to criticism from Governor Kathy Hochul. Hochul wrote a letter earlier this week criticizing the city's handling of the immigration crisis, saying the city has not made timely requests for regulatory changes, has not always promptly shared necessary information with the state, and more. The letter also states that the city can and should do more to act in a proactive and collaborative manner with the state. 
A reporter asked Adams about the letter on Thursday, saying the governor slammed the city. I don't think the governor slammed uh, us. I think the governor did her analysis on probably four areas uh, that uh, really I think they need, just need clarity on. He said the city and state will continue to work together to find a solution that works best for everyone. The key issue is where to house immigrants. In regards to housing, a Twitter account named Scootercaster NY posted the following footage. It shows hundreds of people protesting in front of a Queens hospital on Wednesday. They're against an alleged plan to house a thousand male immigrants in a tent city in this location. As you can see in the footage, police started arresting people after they blocked the entrance to the hospital. Among the arrested people was Curtis Sliwa, former mayoral candidate and founder of the Guardian Angels. Sliwa was on Fox News after the incident, where he blamed President Biden for the ongoing immigration crisis. Watch. Joe Biden started all of this. You remember he said, who's your daddy? Come to America. And boy, they haven't stopped since. The Biden administration previously blamed Republicans for the crisis, saying they should work on bringing changes to the immigration system instead of simply closing the border. And Los Angeles is planning a task force to shatter criminal schemes. As smash and grab retail thefts surge in California, the city hopes to take back control of its shopping scene. NTD's Christina Corona has more. On Thursday, Los Angeles Mayor Karen Bass, along with local law enforcement officials, announced the development of a new task force to crack down on retail thefts. What we've seen over just the past week in the city of Los Angeles and in cities and areas surrounding us is unacceptable, and today we are here to announce regional action. Today we're here to announce multi-agency organized retail crimes task force. Those who commit these crimes will be caught, they will be held accountable, and we will work to address this issue. The new task force plans to hold criminals accountable in the L.A. region. This task force will respond in an organized manner, day and night, seven days a week, with the full scope of investigative resources to compile evidence for successful filings and prosecutions. And not just of those people stealing this merchandise, but of those that are buying and selling this merchandise. And yesterday, the Glendale Police Department announced their first arrest related to the YSL flash mob burglary at the Americana at Brand Shopping Center in Glendale on August 8th. The thieves overwhelmed the store and ultimately fled with over $400,000 in merchandise. An individual by the name of I Ivan Isaac Ramirez, a 23-year-old resident of the city of Los Angeles, he is currently being processed at the Glendale Police Department and is in our custody. A second suspect... Brianna Jimenez, 21 years old, also of the city of L.A., is currently being sought by detectives and has an active arrest warrant, uh, again, for her arrest. Then on Wednesday, six people were arrested in connection with the Nike store robbery in East L.A. that occurred on August 12th, stealing about $1,000 worth of shoes and merchandise. If the public has any information on thefts, the community is urged to call a new hotline at 811-374-9420. Christina Corona, NTD News, Los Angeles. And now for your sports news, here's NTD's Dave Martin with the latest on the point guard James Harden situation in Philadelphia. That's right, Steph. James Harden's relationship with the Philadelphia 76ers seems to be getting worse by the day. The 10-time All-Star on Monday called 76ers president Daryl Morey a liar while at a media event in China, saying he'll never be a part of an organization that Morey's a part of. Yesterday, a reporter in Houston caught up to the former MVP and asked if he thought of his relationship with the Sixers was beyond repair, to which he replied, I think so. This is after news service over the weekend that the Sixers reportedly would not be trading him this summer. Now, earlier this summer, Harden, who could have become a free agent, exercised his player option for the upcoming season while reportedly asking for a trade. The team, though, found no trade offers to their liking and was planning to bring him back. Now, last year, Philadelphia finished third in the Eastern Conference, but lost in the second round of the playoffs to the Boston Celtics. They then let go of head coach Doc Rivers and hired former Toronto coach Nick Nurse. And in NFL news, the Baltimore Ravens have signed three-time Pro Bowl linebacker Jadavian Clowney, according to a report on ESPN. 
The 30-year-old clown, he spent the last two years in Cleveland, which was his fourth different NFL team after Houston selected him first overall in the 2014 draft. Clowney, a pass rushing specialist, made Pro Bowls in 2016, 17, and 18 with the Texans before spending the next two years with Seattle and then Tennessee. And for your sports viewing schedule tonight, 14 baseball games are on, including a rare Yankees Red Sox rivalry match where the two traditionally strong clubs instead sit at the bottom of the AL East. And in the NFL, the New York Giants host the Carolina Panthers, while the Cincinnati Bengals play out the Atlanta Falcons as the league's preseason games continue. And that's it for your sports news today. Steph, over to you. Dave, thanks for that. Next, two brothers discover traditional Chinese culture through dance. They grew up in the West, but have a profound understanding of this ancient art form. They're both professional dancers participating in NTD's 10th International Classical Chinese Dance competition this September. Let's hear how they grasped the essence of traditional Chinese culture. At just 18 years old, Lucas Browdy earned the gold medal at the NTD International Classical Chinese Dance Competition two years ago. I feel like with classical Chinese dance is a bit different because behind it there's so much, that was 5,000 years of culture, right? And then hidden in between the dance there's like all these virtues, all these concepts, all these, all this morality is actually being displayed through dancing. Lucas Browdy and his brother Jesse Browdy were drawn to classical Chinese dance and joined Shen Yun Performing Arts, a leader in this ancient art form. I've been watching Shen Yun since I was a kid, right? But this was the first time that I kind of actually understood the dances, especially the story ones. I almost cried a couple times that night. And uh, I remember going home that night and I, I wanted to be a Shen Yun dancer. <laughs> While other kids were enjoying their youth, these two brothers were dedicated to honing their dance skills. They faced their own distinct challenges along the way. Naturally, my limbs are a bit longer and I'm a bit weaker than everyone else. And also maybe I'm a bit tighter in places that you're supposed to be relaxed. And so it's harder for me to, achieve, to do, perform the jumping techniques and like flipping and stuff. So for me, my big problem would be I have to put in the extra 200% to, to build my strength in order to be able to achieve these uh, tentacle like jumps and flips. Although the path of, path of dance isn't very easy, but I think going through it will make you a much stronger person in the heart. There's so many principles of ancient Chinese culture that go into the dance. And so um, at first I did struggle with this because growing up in the West, but I've, I guess it's a matter of how well you grasp the culture, how, how well you how much you want to grasp the culture in a way. Sometimes you feel like you go through like long periods of time without getting, making much progress. You don't see any hope, I guess, to put it in an extreme way. I guess a lot of, a lot of the times it kind of just, I kind of just have to sit myself down or sit myself down with like a friend or my brother or something like that. And then we just kind of talk about why we're here, what we're doing this for. Like, we're not just here to dance. We're not just here to, you know, practice this art form, but we're also trying to we have a greater purpose. We're trying to spread this culture to uh, the people of the world and tell the truth of what's happening in China, the persecution and stuff like that. Through the day-to-day -day grind of training, the two brothers overcame their inner anxieties and pushed beyond their physical limits. In turn, they live full, rewarding lives. First, through the dance training, I think it taught me diligence, perseverance, and to be positive. Those few lessons, I definitely, it built into me pretty strongly, and I'm pretty grateful for that. Ancient Chinese culture is definitely and an divinely inspired culture, right? And then when you believe that there's this sort of higher being that's bestowing these gifts upon you, sort of, it kind of humbles you in a way. That, it humbles you a lot, actually, because you know that nothing, that Everything that I have, everything that I'm, everything that basically I stand for is, is, is given to me almost. Um, sort of like in the Renaissance, like all, like all of the uh, paintings and sculptures, they're all glorifying the divine. 
The two brothers won gold and silver in the 2021 NTD International Classical Chinese Dance Competition. This year, the competition will take place in early September at Purchase College in New York State. Lucas and Jesse encourage dancers from around the world to participate. Through the competition, you improve a lot because you're practicing techniques, you're practicing movements, and then you're stringing them together in like a, a two-minute technique piece, and you're doing it over and over and over again. And so your strength, your, your dancing, your stamina will all improve greatly. And then through the story dance, your acting, your uh, I guess, will improve a lot. We have, we portray these really amazing stories filled, jam-packed with lessons and morals. By joining this competition, I feel like you improve a lot as a person. I'm very honored to be able to compete with all these people, these great people. We'll improve together, go through much together, and we'll go through strong, so. And if you have any news tips or feedback for our show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Good night.